All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so for those that may not know me, I'm Lance McDew. I'm on the faculty here in the Department of Animal and Range Sciences. I'm a wildlife ecologist, and I've been trying to get Dr. Brady Allred down here to visit with us for almost two years. So when it comes to my annual evaluation, this will be what I hang it all on next year is getting this to happen. So um, we're very fortunate to have Brady with us today. So um, for those that don't know Brady, um, Brady is an associate research professor of rangeland ecology at that other university a few hours west of here. Um, his work has been um, highly impactful, not just for me, but for a lot of folks who work in rangeland ecosystems, um, both for at, at, um, uh, advancing our understanding of basic ecological ecosystems, so in, specifically in rangelands, but also for um, um, contemporary conservation delivery. He provides a lot of science support for the NRCS's Working Lands for Wildlife program, which you're gonna see demonstrated today. I will shut up now and let um, Brady tell us about his research program and the new tools that he's developed to help us all do our jobs better. Thanks for being here, Brady. All right, we'll go this way. Thank you, Lance. Thank you everyone for uh, for coming. It, um, it's actually a real pleasure to be here. It's a real treat to be back at a land grant university. I have to be careful what I say because this is being broadcasted and recorded, uh, but there is um, there is something very special about a land grant university. I, I am a product of the land grant system and uh, I very much appreciate uh, that system. A um, little bit about me just to give a, a background of where I've spent at least the last 40 years of my life for the most part. Um, born and raised in Las Cruces, New Mexico. I uh, did range work down there, worked at the Hornada Experimental Range for many, many years. Um, as as a youngling, but also through my undergraduate years, I like to think of where I work and what I do in relation to plants. And uh, to put it in perspective, Las Cruces, New Mexico gets six to eight inches of rain a year, so it's a, it's a desert. Um, my father was a plant taxonomist down there, um, and his speciality was grasses. Uh, so an agristologist. I knew how to spell and identify Buda Lewis species before I knew how to ride a bike. Uh, and so I, I'm really thankful for him and for all the, the wonderful times we had driving around the state of New Mexico, looking at grasses and looking at rangelands. Um, I then, my wife and I picked up and we moved to Stillwater, Oklahoma. And the year we moved, we got 56 inches of rain. So we went from six inches of rain to 56 inches of rain. Uh, that's a big difference, and I saw what real grass looked like. I saw what real tall grass prairie looked like. I uh, did some fantastic work down there, working with uh, close friends and colleagues, Sam Fuhlendorf and, and the like. Uh, a lot of fire work, a lot of grazing work, a lot of landscape ecology, and, and loved it. Um, about nine, ten years ago, I uh, came to Missoula, came here to Missoula, and I uh, have been loving it. Ever since then, uh, I'm the only range person there uh, in Missoula, and that can be good and that can be bad at sometimes. Uh, it's been it's been mostly good. It's it's given me freedom and flexibility to do to do what I want and to show the uh, show the things I'm going to show today. Um, so rangelands. I apologize that the resolution on this projector is not what it was when I put this um, presentation together. So, so so things might look a little stretched or fuzzy, but I'm going to talk a lot about rangelands. Uh, today and you know rangelands make up a third of at least the lower 48 states. This is a gross simplification of rangelands. So all the stuff in yellow is 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 pasture or range. Um, so it makes up a third of the the United States. About I, I don't know 90 percent of that is really the western United States, of course. And of that 90%, um, two thirds of that is privately owned. Uh, you know, a lot of time when we think about rangelands, depending on the audience I'm talking to, they don't think about that fact that two thirds of that land is privately owned. What does that mean? That means those lands are managed by private landowners, usually by producers, uh, not by federal agencies. 
And producers often don't have the same resources that, you know, say federal agencies have to manage or to monitor rangelands, which I'll be talking uh, a lot about today. So um, I've shared this slide a hundred hundreds of times, and I really like it. I should have changed it, and I'll talk about that in a second. But when you Google rangeland monitoring, these are the images that come up. They are images of people looking down at their boots on the ground, looking at plants, right? And that is largely what identifies the rangeland professor profession. Uh, Neil West said it best about 20 years ago. The range profession has put so much, so much of its training efforts into identification of plant species, sampling within plots, and application of conventional statistical analysis that it hasn't had the background to examine other possible ways of answering the questions really being asked. Um, I used to leave it at that. I would say that's not entirely true now, having lived through the last uh, eight years of my life. The range discipline has actually been at the forefront of this for a very long time. We just haven't recognized it. And I'll, I'll highlight that in a second. But the question is, you know, what is the question? Answering the questions that are really being asked. So what are those questions? There's lots of them. One of them that I'm going to pose to you is this. How much grass does Montana grow? I want an answer. I'll even write it down. But I want three answers. I won't move to the next slide until I get three answers. So let's think of tons, tons of grass. How much grass does Montana grow? How many tons of grass are produced in Montana each year annually? Half a ton per acre. Hey, let's not think per acre. Let's just think total. So like bushels of wheat. So can you do the quick math in your head? <laughs> or just throw out a number. Ninety-three. Okay, so <laughs> someone give me give me an answer. Just spitball. Throw something out. Thirty-five million. Forty-five. Forty-five million. All right. Forty-four million tons. Okay. What else? I need at least one more. Twenty-six million. Twenty-six million. Good. Forty-five point one million. <laughs> point one. All right. There you go. So, you know, we know how much wheat is grown in Montana. I think we estimated. We know how much hay, barley, lentils, peas, you can go down the list. So this is the National Agricultural Statistics Service uh, census. I believe, I can't remember what year this is from, from uh, but you get the idea. We know how much wheat was planted. We know how much wheat was harvested. We know the yield, the production, the bushels, the price. Okay, we know these things really well for conventional crop agriculture. Once we get to the range side of things, right? Okay, we keep track of the cows. Sort of. We do these surveys. Why? Because they're easier to count than the grass, right? Uh, it's easier to count to estimate. Uh, estimate the cow just because of the relationship with industry, economics, and, and things and so forth. But grass, we don't know that answer. And, you know, the question has always been why? Why don't we know that answer, especially in a state like Montana or think Texas, right? Uh, one of, one of the, the biggest grass producing state uh, in the country. Why doesn't Texas know how much grass they produce? And the answer is because of the way we set up our disciplines. And so these guys, um, production, I just sold it with this one slide. They're, they're measuring cover, right? But it's because these methods that we have developed um, to survey our ranches, our pastures, our rangelands across the country, they do not scale. You cannot translate this to that. And that's perfectly okay. They were never meant to scale. Right, that's this that is not their job. Their job was to be able to give you an overview of some geographic unit of land that you were interested in, usually a pasture 
or a ranch or a watershed or, or some other unit, right? But there is a geographic bounds and those bounds were fairly re reasonable. Uh, and then uh, we stole from crop agriculture, the field of statistics and decided to apply it to uh, rangelands. And it's worked great. It's been the foundation, like Wes said earlier, it's been the foundation of our discipline. But unfortunately, it doesn't allow us to answer questions like how much grass grows in Montana or across the entire country. So what I'm gonna talk about today is this method, right? Using satellite remote sensing. Now we've been talking about this for a long time and, and I'll share the next slide a little bit more about that. But the idea is these do scale. These methods were meant to scale and it goes all the way back to um, really the military and we couldn't put enough spies. We couldn't gather enough information around the world to, to, and to be able to process that information. And so we put up satellites up in space to be able to gather that information for us. And so they were meant to scale. Now, this is where West got it wrong. Um, the rangeland discipline has been at the forefront of satellite, satellite remote sensing from the very beginning. Uh, this is a, a photograph on the left, 1972. This is the first Landsat satellite. Uh, it wasn't called Landsat back then, but this was Landsat 1, and it was launched. So we're celebrating 50 years of Landsat satellite missions. Um, in 1976, Dr. Maxwell, this was actually his PhD, uh, PhD dissertation. He was at a Colorado State University. This was actually, the dissertation was published in 74, but he published his paper in 76 in the Journal of Range Management, saying satellite imagery could provide range managers with maps and tables giving standing crop biomass for selected species, groups, or range types. He and his colleagues were part of a NASA symposium. I'm not even sure if it was called NASA back then. I think it was. Uh, but a NASA symposium where talking about using satellite remote sensing for agriculture and range was at the top of the list. So we recognized from the very, very beginning that we could do this. I wasn't even born in 76. All right. So, I mean, we've been talking about this for a very, very, very long time. I have to joke that the title of this paper is a remote rangeland analysis system, which is very similar to the rangeland analysis uh, platform uh, title that we, that we gave it. Uh, so there's been this disconnect where a lot of the times we think a lot like Charlie Brown, where it's this personal game. They win or we win. This method is, the methodology is the most important and the most accurate. And it should be used. It should, or this methodology can't get at that information that is provided with this methodology, right? And we think that there's only one winner and one way to do these things. But the reality is they're both right and they're both wrong. But when you combine them together, you can really get that synergistic effect of monitoring, where this can really get us information at that local scale that can sometimes, maybe not all the time, be absolutely necessary for management. This can give us that information at this broader scale so we can actually pick our heads up and see what's happening on our neighbor's pasture, because what's happening on their pasture, if you think of invasive species, is bound to happen on your pasture or the next county over. Or we can get a snapshot so we can understand what is the state of rangelands across the country. How productive are they? What are the threats that are facing rangelands, you know, nationally or continentally if we if we zoom out and look at all of North America? So my main message here is it's not a zero sum game. They can both win and they can be used in tandem. And that's what I've been trying to uh, evangelize, for lack of a better way to say it, um, for the last couple of years. So here's the answer. I'm not sure who is closer, 32 million tons on average of grass grows in the state of Montana. It bounces around, this is out of date, this only goes to 2019, we need to update this. But it bounces around, um, you can say on average, probably about 32 million, 31 million wheat, 227 million bushels, 26.8 million tons, if you convert that. Uh, we grow a lot more grass uh, in the state than we do wheat. Now I'm preaching to the choir. You guys all know this, 
But these numbers really haven't been quantified before. And so on some level, we can start to say, you know, maybe range and grass is no longer going to be that stepchild of conventional agriculture. We can start playing with the big boys and we can show, we can quantify our products, we can quantify our output, we can show our relevance to our stakeholders and say, hey, grass is just as important from a producer perspective, from a social perspective, from a wildlife perspective, you name it. Okay, so I'm going to jump in and, and talk about the rangeland analysis platform now. And really, um, what the what the rangeland analysis platform or RAP? I swear we did not think of that acronym when we came up with this name, but that is what everyone calls it now is the RAP. Um, a little bit of regret about that, but what the, what the RAP actually is is it's two things. First is first and foremost, it's data. There are these two primary data sets that I'm going to talk about today. Explain how we built them and what they mean and what can be done with them. That's the engine of the rangeland, rangeland analysis platform. The second is a web application that easily visualizes and allows you to do some very simple summary statistics aggregations on that data because these data are so large and so massive, your average person cannot even begin to wrap their head around uh, how to implement them uh, in their day to day operations. So, we built this simple web application. So, the first data set I'm going to talk about is um, this rangeland cover data set, uh, percent cover. It's produced annually. And what it is, it's a measure of continuous cover, aerial cover. So think of like line point intercept transect, measuring aerial cover. Um, it's, a, it's an estimate of that. And so it ranges from zero to 100%. It's not categorical. This is not saying something is grass, tree, or shrub. This is how much of grass, how much shrub, how much trees are there in that specific location or that satellite pixel. So to do that, um, we got 75,000 on the ground plots that were scattered, you know, mostly in the Western United States, but scattered across the lower 48 states. Um, these were the NRCS NRI plots that have been collected through the years, uh, starting in 2004, the grazing land survey plots, uh, in conjunction with the BLM AIM, assessment inventory and monitoring plots. So one is collected on private lands, NRCS collects that information on private lands, BLM, of course, collects their information on, on BLM public lands. And we also um, threw in, in our latest version of the data set, some National Park Service data sets that use the same protocol as well. So we have these 7, 75,000 on the ground plots collected by real people. If you've ever, has anyone ever collected some of this data? There you go. I should buy you lunch, give you a hug, do something afterwards. Thank you. Thank you very much because. Without these data, um, this, none of this would have been possible. So we took that information and what we did is we combined it with the uh, Landsat satellite record. Uh, as I said, Landsat's been going for the last 50 years, but really in the early 80s, 1984, really 85, 86 is when things really got going. And so we have a continuous record of Landsat images for this country starting from 1985. And um, depending on, upon the year, an image is taken every eight or 16 days, depending on if we have one or two sensors up in the sky. Right now we have uh, three sensors, uh, to be honest. So we combine that, that plot data with the Landsat data. Um, the Landsat pixel resolution is 30 meters by 30 meters. So if you think about that, uh, I'm supposed to stay close to the microphone. I tend to walk, so I, I apologize for those online. If you think about 30 meters by 30 meters, that's about the size of a baseball diamond. So get that image in your mind. And so we record that information or the sensors record that information all across all across the world. And then lastly, you know, I showed that paper that was written in 1976 that really laid all this out. And the question is, why, why didn't we do it in 1976 if, if we knew how to do it? Well, one, we didn't have this. We didn't have this. This wasn't up and going. Real thing is we didn't have this. And the power of cloud computing now, uh, we now have computers or really multiple computers that are stringed together and storage space that can analyze these data efficiently. And this really didn't happen up until about 10 years ago. 
Uh, we could do things locally and we can make do projects in our backyard or in our experiment station properties. We could make maps and do that. But if you wanted to do something all across the country, it was nearly impossible, logistically impossible uh, 10 years ago. Now it's it's very much possible. OK, uh, if this slide interests you, come and talk to me afterwards. Otherwise, I'm largely going to skip it. All I'm going to say is to build our vegetation cover data set. We use a machine learning method, specifically a temporal convolutional model. Uh, it's similar to the other convolutional neural networks are out there. The point is we had a really good model that took all that on the ground data and combined it with Landsat data and only Landsat data, only satellite data. We didn't use soils data. We didn't use weather data. Uh, and that it incorporated Landsat images, you know, say from January, March, May, throughout the year. So it's not just a Landsat image in, in like the summertime. We incorporated this temporal sequence of images. Uh, and then we built this um, neural network architecture to really give us some good information. So if that interests you, talk to me afterwards and we can geek out about that. So here's what we, here's what we produce as our vegetation cover data set. There's five categories on the screen here. There's actually six, one that we don't show often, uh, but we have estimates of continuous cover for perennial forbs and grasses, annual forbs and grasses, trees, shrubs, and bare ground. Produced at an annual time set from 1986 to present at that 30 meter resolution, so of a baseball diamond. So if you think, if you scattered baseball diamonds across the entire country, that's a lot of baseball diamonds. It's something like 15 billion. We have information for every single one of them. And we can say that particular area is 50% grass, 5% tree, 20% get bare ground or whatever. That doesn't add up to 100, but whatever, whatever the combination is, right? So we can get that sub-pixel information. So it's not just this is grass, this is shrub. We can say how much grass is there? How much shrub is there? So something that's really never been able, never, never been done before. Up until January of this year, it was actually just the Western United States. With our latest release, our version three uh, release, we now cover the entire uh, CONUS domain. So why would we want this information, right? I'm gonna switch gears here a little bit from technology and science to application. And this is, this is a sign, this is a image scenario that you're gonna see kind of throughout the talk. This is uh, a spot in central Oklahoma and you can see it's a woodland. This is 2018. This is an aerial photo uh, photograph. 2003, you can see that wood, woody encroachment, woodland encroachment's been happening, right? So this is tall grass prairie. You remove fire, the trees grow up, and you lose them. So this is what it looked like in 2014. And this is, we actually have data. So there's actual plot, the cover, 96% tree, 0% grass production, zero right zero pounds per acre no no grass growing there that's what it looked like if you look at our data sets it lines up pretty good right no data sets perfect and so uh here's 2014 this is grass cover this is tree cover uh 2018 is right here uh, here's 2014 when we collected the data on the ground so we can say yeah we're pretty good you know for all intents and purposes we're gonna put our engineers hat and that works here's 2003 right and so we go back a little bit further though we see a different story we go back all the way to the 90s and the 80s this woodland used to be a grassland so in the matter of 30 years this became this went from a productive grassland and we'll talk about production in a moment to a woodland so with these data sets we can see things in space, so we can look at our neighbor's pasture or at other places that we don't, might not have on the ground monitoring information, or perhaps we don't have enough resources to collect all the on ground, all the on ground plots that we want. So we can look across space, but more importantly, we can see how things are changing through time. So why is this important? How have trees changed in Montana? So this is another question we might be asking. The resolution's uh, a little fuzzy here, but here's a map of absolute tree cover change just since 1990. So we have a, an increase of more than a million acres in trees, a little bit of a decrease. That's our net increase. 
This is area across Montana. Areas that are, in, are experiencing woody encroachment. And when you think of Montana, you, you don't often think of woody encroachment, right? But I was talking with a, a handful of people this morning and every single one of them brought this up. So we're starting to notice it. So we can actually quantify that now. Uh, and so this information is important for that. Here's the thing, uh, what did it used to look like? I'm gonna take a risk here and show you uh, something. Hopefully this will work. Um, since we're talking about woody encroachment, on this page, which I'll show a little bit later, uh, you can go down here and look at historical imagery. We have, really, uh, Scott Morford, who's a member of our team there at University of Montana, has, um, orthorectified a whole bunch of aerial imageries from the 40s, 50s, and some 70s in some parts of Montana, but we have the entire state of Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming done, so you can see what things used to look like 80 years ago. Uh, this is in the Blackfoot River Valley. On the left is from the 50s. On the right is present-day imagery. I'm going to show you one I think might be close to home. The Red Bluff. That's what it looks like now. That's what it used to look like 80 years ago. So we can quantify that with our data, but we can only go back 30, 40 years, you know, at the most. But now we have this tremendous resource of being able to visualize it. And as I was saying earlier, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Uh, and so being able to sit down with the producer or with an agency personnel and show them, this is how your pasture, how your ranch has changed due to woody encroachment, that is gold. All right, let's get back here. Okay, so if we quantify it across the entire Western United States, so this is using our older data set when we were just restricted to this geography, this is where tree cover is increasing. And surprisingly, of course, right? You think of the Southern Great Plains. Yes, anyone who's spent time down there know that they have a huge problem down there uh, with woody encroachment. But you see, it's really happening everywhere. And really, it's on par with crop conversion. So when you think of Western rangelands and the threats that they face, crop conversion, land use conversion, agriculture is usually the first one that comes to mind, especially in our part of the world, kind of the Northern Great Plains. But woody encroachment tree cover expansion is right there along with it. And it's it's a thing we call it the green glacier, right? It happens so slowly that you don't recognize it. It's like that box that you put in your living room that sits there for like weeks because you just get used to it and you walk around it and you don't move it. That's how trees, they grow slowly, uh, more fast in some parts of the country, but it's a slow process and you just get used to it. Okay. We're going to switch gears here and um, talk about vegetation production. So here is a map that's available on the, on the website, the web application, which I'll show here uh, when I'm done, a map of herbaceous production, literally rangeland production measured in pounds per acre. So that's the currency, right, that rangeland managers operate in, pounds per acre. And you can see, as you'd expect, the Great Plains, right? Much more productive as you get further west, much less productive. Florida as well, some of the most productive rangelands occur in Florida. So how did we do this? Um, I'm not going to get into the details, but it's there's some very well-established, well-respected uh, models that can measure basically carbon, plant carbon. Think of it as plant photosynthesis or ecosystem photosynthesis and their light use efficiency models. And so you can get a measurement of how much sun is hitting, hitting the, the ground or the plant, how much is being reflected back. You can put some controls, some knobs and levers on that to control for climate, for weather, uh, moisture constraints and other things. So we took that and we modified them for our specific uses. One problem though we had is those models depend upon defining the land cover. And they're always, they have always been categorical classifications of land cover where they say this specific area that we're interested, in, it's a grassland. And so it gets these model parameters or it's a shrubland. So it gets these parameters or it's a tree, it's a forest, it gets these parameters. But if you look at this, what would you call this? 
Is this a grassland? Is that a shrubland? What is that? You know, it doesn't fit into either one of these categories. So this is actually, to be honest, where we started and we decided we needed to come up with a new land cover product and a new model that allows us to, to change that. And so that's how we actually came up with this. It's no longer are we doing these categorical classifications. We're saying how much of that area is trees, how much of it is grass, how much of it is shrub. So we're able to integrate those uh, into, into our models. And what we can do is we can separate out the plant production um, by these functional groups. And so this is a spot in Montana, I can't remember where, but it, it's got a cover of 24% annuals, 59% uh, perennials and 9% shrub. That's just aerial cover estimates. And then for the year, we can measure what that photosynthesis looks like. By perennials, we measure it each day of the year from January 1 all the way to December 31st. By annuals, and you see if you look at annuals, there's less annuals out there. Also, annuals have a less, do, do less photosynthesis in general. There's less plant material, and so they have, they're photosynthesizing less. But you can see when the senescence start to happen. With annuals, they dry out. They cure much more sooner than perennials. So we pick that up. And then we can see shrubs. Shrubs don't ever photosynthesize very much. Uh, they're slow growers. Um, but we can separate that out. And so that was another big advancement. So that gives us photosynthesis and carbon, really, um, net primary production. Uh, how do we convert that to above ground biomass? Well, we took some simple just conversion factors where we can convert, can convert carbon to an estimate of dry biomass. And there's been some work done that allows for the partitioning of how much is partitioned above ground versus below ground. And eventually what we can get is an estimate of above ground biomass converted to pounds per acre uh, for every day of the year, actually. And then we sum that up in 16 day intervals. And so we're, we provide that information at 16 day intervals. That's a lot of technical speak. If you're interested in that, uh, find me afterwards. I can, I can talk forever about that. But what it gives us is it gives us the way to measure production for perennial herbaceous, annual herbaceous, and then we can combine them and say for give a total herbaceous production. And we have that annually available for each year, so we can get like the sum total production for the entire year. But we also have it at 16 day intervals. This is a spot, I want to believe it's in Texas, I can't remember. Um, that it kind of has this little bimodal distribution, but we separate out perennials and annuals. So we can see how things have changed, not just from year to year, but also within a growing season. And this is available from 1986 to present, also at 30 meter resolution. And when I mean present, um, it's almost a near real time. So you can go and see how much growth has occurred, you know, two weeks ago. Um, right now, in our part of the country, nothing's really growing. Uh, it's starting to, but in you know California and Texas, things have been growing. Sometimes they don't ever stop growing. Um, they've been growing for a while, and so you can monitor that. So we have this ability now to not just monitor the cover, but the production of anything across the country. Why? Why would you want to do this? So this is a, a graphic we put together um, at the beginning of this year, looking at okay, what was, what was last year like across the West? And so here in our part of the country, Montana, the North, we, we were in a big drought last year. Everyone knows that. How bad was it? Well, this was a pasture over by Mile City. That, bo that bottom line, that red dashed line is 50% of average production. The black line is what it was in 2021. So 2021 had hit 50% of its 30 year average. That's pretty bad. That doesn't happen that often guys. Uh, so they were in a very bad drought. Elko, Nevada, 75%. So these are, you can think of these as a growth curve throughout the year. I'm, I'm not sure exactly where or what this was in Kit Carson, but they were above average. That green line is 150%. 
Tucson, Arizona, they benefited from a very strong monsoon season uh, last year and really got a huge increase uh, in production relative to their 30 year average. So what's the point of all this? The point is we can quantify this now. And again, we're on par with conventional agriculture. We can say, instead of measuring cows, like we used to, that's like measuring combines instead of measuring the harvest, right? We, we can actually measure the resource that's being utilized and we can say, this is how bad or how good it was. Lots of implications here. Think uh, FSA and emergency drought payments. Okay, going back to this little thing, make sure we're gonna stay on time. So this is our, this is our, our spot in central Oklahoma. This is the tree cover, as I said, changed through time. Uh, it used to be a grass, a grassland. Well, how productive was it? Well, back in the early 80s, it was pretty productive. 2,000 pounds per acre. That's a nice, productive, tall grass prairie. Lots of grass growing. As those trees moved in, it shades out the grass. The trees get more and more. The grass gets less and less. That production went to zero. So the question becomes, how much grass did we actually lose to trees? So one of the things we can do, just because we're scientists, we like to play with data, we can model, well, what if that tree encroachment actually didn't happen? And that's what that blue line is. And we can account for weather because, you know, it's not, it's not the same every year. Production varies, of course. Uh, this is the year of the big drought uh, in the Great Plains, 2011. Um, but the blue line represents if trees had stayed at the same level they were in 1990, this is more or less what production may have looked like. So, in whoops, oh, my, my slide didn't show up. In agriculture, this difference right here is called yield gap. And it's a very commonly well used term to estimate the gap between yield what was possible versus yield what actually occurred. So let's go to a different area real quick. This is in Nebraska. We're going to use some of our aerial imagery that we've been working on. 1956, this is more or less a square mile. This is what it looked like. 1992, see the trees coming in. 2018, this is all eastern red cedar, by the way, a fire intolerant uh, species, if you just have fire on the landscape, it completely gets, gets rid of it, keeps it at bay. 2018, that's what it used to look like. We've gone from a wholesale conversion from a grassland to a woodland. Well, how much grass did we lose to trees? So in this one square mile, starting from 1990 to here, we lost 400,000 pounds of grass. That translates to 228 AUMs. This is important, especially in Nebraska, because a lot of their state lands fund public schools. So we can now keep track of these threats that are happening. We can actually quantify them and say what their impacts are. Imagine if you'd be able to run 228 more AUMs on your place uh, than you did, than you're able to run now. We can also produce maps like these that not just looks at it in specific areas, but we can look at it you know, at the county level. And we can say, in 2019, what were the production losses relative to tree encroachment? That is, how much grass did we lose to tree encroachment in 2019? And of course, the Southern Great Plains lights up as we expect it would, but look at Montana. We're losing grass to trees. And the bigger question is, are we doing anything about it? These data aren't gonna solve that problem. These data can help us understand and help us can create strategies to solve that problem. They can help us quantify our impacts and evaluate, is our management working? But the bigger question is, what are we doing to actually stop that? Okay. I got about five minutes or so, so we can have plenty of time for questions. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to show this app a little bit just to get you familiar with it. Uh, but I'd encourage you to really play with it on your own. Uh, you're not going to break it. Uh, you can't break it. You might run into a bug. And if you do, let me know. But you're not going to be able to break it. Um, 
This is a rangeland analysis platform, so simply rangelands.app.app. Um, I should have said at the very beginning, you know, we worked alongside the NRCS and, and the BLM to fund all of this work and, and to produce it. So they, they were definitely major players uh, in, in doing this. And so we have, you go to that, you go to this, what we call the landing page, the front page, and there's some things down here. Um, we have a couple of different things. We have the RAP application itself, which I'll demonstrate. We have a production explorer, which is another tool um, that really shows the same information uh, on the RAP site, but presented a little bit differently. It might be easier to understand. Um, we have some cheatgrass apps that look at the Great Basin cheatgrass. Um, and this is that historical imagery app. You should spend some time looking at that. I'll also say, if you go up here, we have uh, some information about the data products itself. You can click that and it has links to all the papers, the error rates, all that nitty gritty scientific information uh, that you may want. And then lastly, we have this support page, uh, which I'll just click on, that really talks about how to use this web application, how it was made. There's videos, there's articles, there's tutorials. Um, this is really produced for like the end user in mind, like the lay person. And so it's an excellent place to start. But just to give you an idea, you can go here and click launch wrap and it'll load the application. And so this is um, sitting on top of a familiar Google Maps interface. It looks much better on a on a different screen. Um, but you can see, I'll just zoom out here. Uh, you can see uh, we're looking at the 48 uh, states here. We have uh, agriculture and development and water masked out. So you can, all the areas where all the ag occurs, we have that masked out. You can turn that mask on and off. And so if you have an area that is a field now, but maybe it wasn't a field back in the 80s or 90s, you can look at the production of what it used to be in the 80s or 90s. Um, but real quickly, I'll just show highlight uh, one of the things you can do. You can upload a shape file or draw a polygon for uh, our intents and purposes. We're just gonna upload this. This is a Montana grazing allotment um, that we're looking at right now. And what we're looking at, the layer we're looking at is um, vegetation cover. And so it's an estimate of perennial forb and grass cover. We can also look at production if we wanted for the year 2021. Um, or we can go look at different years, 2019. Uh, you can see just different years. But what you can do is you can click that and then it's going to do a quick little analysis of your pro uh, polygon that you might be interested in and it gives you data. So this is when we talk about data at your fingertips. This is what a rancher or a producer or a range con can very quickly use to say, how is my allotment? How is my pasture? How is my ranch? Uh, so this is a graph of percent cover through time. Um, I'm just going to make this big to show. I'm going to turn things on and off just to walk you through it. So right now we're just looking at perennial forb and grass cover. And you know, it's for the most part, it's maybe increased a little bit through the years, kind of stays stable, gone from 35 to you know 50 percent uh, perennial forb and grass cover. You can look at your annual forb and grass cover. Uh, you might look at that and see an upward trend, uh, perhaps uh, in that particular case. You can look at shrubs and uh, trees. Uh, you kind of get the idea, and so you can get this information really easily without ever you know having to do any analysis yourself. You can also look at annual biomass. Um, this is um, herbaceous biomass, which is perennial and annuals combined, but then perennial forb and grass biomass and annual forb and grass biomass. You can see this particular allotment has had a lot of change uh, through the years in, in terms of biomass production, going from 400 pounds per acre all the way up to 1,000 pounds per acre. There's been favorable precipitation. Um, during that time period, but we actually called them and talked to them and yes, management has changed, uh, particularly destocking had occurred um, over the years. And lastly, you can also look at 16 day biomass uh, and just make this big so we can all see it. This is what 2022 looks like uh, as of March 5th. It's, there's been a little bit of bug with the satellite data, so we haven't updated it um, recently. But you can look at uh, things as they occur last year, 2021, if we just want to look at our herbaceous production. So this is basically a growth curve during the year. You can see how that compared to the previous year. 
little bit more and you can go back and you can get information. Uh, you know, as I said, as humans, we're not very good at remembering accurately and we're definitely not very good at recording things unless we're, it's really important to us. So this has been very helpful for people to fill in the gaps when there's not data available or when you know, everyone remembers that good year or that bad year and they can compare to how things were then. All right, I've been talking for a long time, uh, so I guess I'll uh, I'll just be quiet and we can have some time for questions. Go to the app, take it for a spin. Uh, if you have any questions, we can talk about them now, or you can always reach out and uh, email me, and uh, we can talk about them then. Thank you. Yes. I have a question. Um, so you, you mentioned some of the federal support programs. I'm going to call it federal. Have you guys looked into how well your production models tie to their kind of, like I said, they use to trigger payments? Um, like that's that that's a hairy topic, and this is being recorded. <laughs> so uh, let's just say that. Um, We've, yes, we've looked into it and, you know, rightfully so the, um, the, the methods and the triggers for those payments are, were developed in a day and age when data sets like these weren't available. Right. And so they use a lot of the times they use gridded weather data, uh, which sometimes work and, and sometimes doesn't. Uh, and so, um, I won't advocate for anything one way or the other, but I think we're at a day at day and age now where we can do a better job of, of administering those programs and, you know, making sure that, you know, they're administered, you know, where and when they need, when and should be administered. Thanks. Yes. Is RAP a product or where are you taking it besides applications? Yeah, so RAP is a finished project. We started in 2018 and that's when it was first launched. And we started with just our cover data set. And then in 2020, we added uh, version two of our cover data set and version two of our production data set. And just last January in 20, 2022, we added version three of both data sets. And so the data sets themselves are constantly improving. In fact, version two was a leaps and bound improvement over version one. Uh, so it is a finished product. It is the goal of all this has been to produce operational and off the shelf products that people can just use. And when I say the word operational, I mean that people can rely on them. People can use them. They're there, they're updated, they're maintained, they're consistent, right? Uh, think of other land cover type data sets or land fire or the soil survey data. These are operational type of things. And when I mean off the shelf, like you just grab them and you don't have to do anything with them. You can just, you can use them. You can use them on the, on the web app itself. Or if you're familiar with the data handling and being able to wrangle that large amounts of data, you can grab the data and use it in a research project, use it in your operations. Uh, large um, uh, livestock companies, not just producers, but like global livestock companies are using these data to better track what, how are things, you know, how are rangelands across the United States. We've expanded into Canada. That's not released yet, but we'll have Southern Canada and all the rangelands of Canada. And we're working in Mexico as well to, to get that going. So yes, it's operational. Yes, you can use it. Where we're going into the future is um, one, trying to make them better. There's just constant improvement. Uh, they're not perfect. They're, you know, no data set is perfect. Even on the ground data that we collect is, isn't perfect. Um, so we, we constantly make them better. And then um, we constantly think of things, oh, let's try this, or what about, what about forecasting? You know, we have a vast data set at our hands. Maybe we could, produce some short term forecasts or maybe some longer term forecasts that may or may not be helpful. So we're, we keep thinking about the future. Follow up question, the average age of a rancher is say 60 years old here in Montana. How well are they are accepting this technology working with NRCS employees? Or um, it's, it's, it's about what you'd expect, right? Um, there are some that are very uh, progressive and that adopt it very well. Uh, or very quickly. Others are a little bit more skeptical, um, and skept skepticism is good in, in this case. Um, I think the value has been 
the ease of access that a lot of the times a rancher or a producer will sit down with a range con uh, or with a BM, BML uh, personnel that's managing their allotment and they'll look at this together. And the nice thing is we have, it's, it's, it's the same everywhere, meaning they can look at on their BLM allotment, then they can look at it on their private land as well. And it's not a different project or a different set of data. It's the same data set. And that's built a lot of trust. It's a common currency spatially kind of across the entire landscape. Um, some producers jump into it a lot. Many of you might be familiar with Bill Milton, uh, uh, north of here, um, northeast of here. He's, he uses it a lot on his operation. You know, he's obviously, I think, pretty progressive. Um, and so we built the web application so a, a layperson can't use it. And we try to keep it as simple as we can. Yes. So where you ground truth this, what kind of hard and where is in a great question. So I purposely left all that out on the talk so I wouldn't have to show you all our mistakes. Uh, no, if you go to the website and click on this um, products section, we have kind of brief descriptions and links to all the um, peer review papers. And so you can get all the nitty gritty error details as well as the methodology there. Here is a um, scatter plot of our production data set that we compare it wrap herbaceous above ground biomass to NRI herbaceous biomass. So we had somewhere else, I think 16,500 NRI plots um, that are not all collected in the same manner. So you have to take that with a grain of salt. And some of them are ocular estimates. Some of them would actually clip and weigh other things. But you can see, right, there, it's, a, it's an okay relationship. It's, it's not perfect. There's a lot of times that we miss things, uh, but the vast majority of it, you know, the trend is really, is, is really good. Um, you go down a little bit, we show some maps where we compare our data to some other data sets, as well as to the soil survey. Uh, data sets as well, and there's they're very much in good good agreement. And then lastly, down here are errors for our cover product. Uh, the cover the cover data is really an empirical model, so we can do these we can calculate these errors. And so for in this case, you know, mean absolute error for perennial forbs and grasses is ten point two. So if you have fifty percent cover plus or minus ten percent uh, for perennial forbs and grasses, shrubs and trees trees particularly is 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 very very low, so that's really good. So it's it's not, you know, we're not dialing in for that uber precise measurement. We're, again, we're trying to make this operational and off the shelf. And so for most management, that error is probably acceptable. Well, I think this is phenomenal. So much better. I mean, we tried some of this with different sensors on the ground level. Mm -hmm. with Personnel over the place. Nothing works. Yeah. Well, this is phenomenal. Let's see. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Right. Follow that question up and ask. So, your accuracy assessment that you just showed was national, spatial, national scale. Have you looked at see how like divided that into regional chunks? How you demonstrate like this? This part of the country is really good, whereas in, in this system or this part of the country, there's a lot of associated. Yeah, it's. I'm going to put my geeky academic hat on right now. Yes, we have, but that's really hard to do, and it's not an accurate way of evaluating because the models we built were national models. Our one thing I, I failed to gloss over, or I failed to mention, I glossed over it is our models do incorporate latitude and longitude. So there is a spatial component there. So the model has some sense of where you are in the country. Um, now that said, like if, if you were to look at the, how does the desert Southwest compare to say the Northern Great Plains? Um, in the strictest interpretation of the model and the stats, you shouldn't do that because that's not the way the model was um, developed. Now we've done that. Um, it's, there's no clear pattern. Sometimes things look really good right here. And this honestly, a few pixels over, it's bad. Um, and so on the whole though, when you, when you evaluate the model generally entirely, it looks really good. And so we, when we, when we tell people about this and particularly end users, this isn't meant to replace boots on the ground. 
And this isn't meant to replace local data at all. We always say we have this huge thing we always talk about when we do these trainings. Use this in conjunction with your local data, if you have it. Many times people don't have it. But use it in conjunction with your local knowledge, your expertise, everything. Consider it another tool in the toolbox. Um, some people like that answer. Some people don't because they like, I got too many tools in the <laughs> toolbox anyway. Um, I just want a number and I just want to go with something. So there, you do have to have some critical thinking to go along with this. It's not just, you can have it spit out a number and you can just run with it. And I'd be fine with that. But I'd encourage people like, put it alongside what you know about the system. So several graduate students in the audience might be like, talking about the bit saying, how do I get these products raw form, not the, not the conditions of the changes over time, raw products for a period of time that corresponds to my study to use in my science. Yes. So, um, three words that you need to learn, Google Earth Engine. And these data sets are, the total size of them are 25 terabytes. You wanna download that and put that on your computer? Good luck. Um, so, Google Earth Engine is a um, cloud-based uh, processing platform for Earth observation data, particularly, you know, satellite remote sensing data is, is the primary use. Um, use that for your research. All these data are available in there. And so that way you can do all, you don't have to download anything, you need all the processing there. If you want to download uh, the data, you can download the annual cover data sets. Uh, all said and done, that's about a terabyte worth of data and the annual production data, which is, I think, a terabyte and a half um, for the entire country uh, for all the years. Uh, we don't make the 16-day data available for download because it's just too massive. Uh, but on the website, you can go and find the links to download these data. And I would encourage you to get familiar with geospatial tools um, like Google Earth Engine or even there's, uh, I'll geek out a little bit here, but like the GDAL command line tools and other things that will help you manage large data sets like these. Taylor. I apologize if I missed this, but how are you differentiating between like perennial biomass and annual biomass? Yeah, I so I glossed over that. And I really didn't talk about it, but what it is is because we built this data set right here of the cover, we're able to partition the biomass from the model and say so much biomass went to perennial forbs or grasses, so much went to annual forbs and grasses. And it's not just a simple map trick because we know annuals usually green up sooner and senesce sooner. Uh, and so we account for the phenology as well. And so by incorporating our vegetation covered data set into our biomass model, um, we're able to separate out that production that is occurring. So it's coming from the, the on the ground plots or is it coming from the Ultimately, yes. So th this data set was created with the on the ground plots. So yeah, it's kind of, we, we combine two models and two data sets in order to do this. Oh, litter. We have an estimate for litter as well. And that's, people usually aren't interested in that. So it's just not up here. Talk to more bird people. <laughs> I do, and they're the ones that use it. So. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Dr. Hunter. Seems cool, man.